Well, good morning, everybody, and a very warm and hearty welcome to you all. Is that Lorraine behind the mask? <laughs> welcome. And welcome to the folks uh, connecting online. There's a number. And please take your mask off. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Get so used to these things. <laughs> Times have I driven all the way home with my mask on, alone in the car? <laughs> A couple of announcements. Um, first of all, please remember that the Covenant Family Bible Study will be taking place, Lord willing, this. Saturday, 1st of August, at 11 a.m. at the college. Um, so, do come along to that, if you'd like to. Um, the other thing that we need to just be aware of is that um, we shouldn't become complacent as far as the, the uh, precautions against COVID go. Uh, now, if ever, is going to be the time that, that we need to be particularly vigilant. Uh, this came home to us this week when a customer in the bookshop came in and spoke about a pastor, his friend, who had just died of COVID, which had been contracted in a church situation. So we, we, we need to take heed, we need to be warned, and we be particularly careful. So please, uh, all the things that they tell us all the time, uh, let's observe them. Please do pray for our brother Patrick, who's been bleeding a lot. I'm glad to see that he's here today. We trust that the Lord will keep him strong enough uh, to preach the word today. Although we have been on standby, and still are on standby. <laughs> it's down to the last minute, I think. <laughs> uh, so uh, may the Lord watch over his suffering ones. And, uh, Please regularly pray for all of them, and particularly for Patrick. Let's bow in a moment of prayer, a silent prayer. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Let us sing praise to our God in the words of Psalm 1 verse 6 in the back section of the hymn books. Psalm 1 verse 6.
sovereign Lord God, our Father. Come down, we pray, from heaven and meet with your churches and assemble in the name of Christ their Lord this morning. Cause your people to worship you in spirit and truth and fill their hearts with love, joy and gratitude as they come before you. Remembering all that you have done, your great love and kindness, your salvation wrought at Calvary, having been written in the books before the world began. We thank you, Father, that you have worked out the redemption of all your people by the work of the Spirit. We pray that this same Spirit may help us in our worship today. We pray that he may take the word of Christ we read and hear preach and write it on our hearts. That he would give us a spirit of humble obedience and that he would make our hearts alive to Christ our Savior. That we may increase in love to him, may grow in faith and knowledge, and may walk in the ways that our Savior has appointed for us, the ways of truth and goodness that lead to life. We thank you that you've given us a clear, well-lit path. And we thank you for the law of the Lord, which is good and sweet as honey from the honeycomb. We thank you that we may delight in every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we thank you for feeding us as your little ones that must grow in the Savior. So please see to it that every one of your chosen ones is saved in the end. And we thank you for your love individually to each one. We particularly ask for help to those in need this morning, for the sustaining of your people in their sufferings. We remember those that are not able to be at worship this morning on account of illness and, and pain. We pray that you be with them at, at home on the sick bed. And also be with your servant Patrick who brings your word later on. Grant that your hand may be upon him and may be kept strong for that task. And thank you that you have sustained him these past years through many sufferings and through much ill health. We, we ask for your gracious dealings with your people this morning. And so turn our hearts, we pray, to the true praise and worship of your great name. Preserve us from distractions and worldly thinking. Grant that in this time we may simply delight in being in the presence of the Lord our God and Father. Thank you that you've bought us by your blood and that we are yours and you are ours. And you've given this to us in solemn covenant. And we pray that we may be given grace to honor and keep this covenant through your spirit. We ask it all in Christ's name and unto his glory. Amen. Amen. Now let's sing once again, this time hymn number 109. Awake my soul, and with the sun thy daily stage of duty run. Hymn 109.
1, uh, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 for the morning reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. Man has his father's wife. You are proud. Should you rather have been, shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, Hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the last, on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written it to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the immoral the wicked man from among you. So again we come before God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we pray that you would help us both now and on a daily basis to be careful in connection with our sins and your holy law. To be careful in confessing our sins to you. To be careful in truly repenting from the wicked ways in which we have walked, whether in thought, word, or deed. Ask for your Spirit to be given to us, your Holy Spirit, who makes your hope people holy and who grants us the wonderful grace of the shame that causes us to confess our sins to you. Thank you for the conviction in our hearts, not only that your word is true and your law is good, but also that we have offended in many ways. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us to search our hearts and to know rightly the ways of truth from the ways of goodness, of wickedness, and not to confuse them. We pray, Lord, that we may be ready and willing and quick to repent of all of our sins mm -hmm. and to own them before you. Remember the words of the psalm, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And we thank you nonetheless, our Father, when we do come to you ashamed and disgraced in our sin and defiled, nonetheless, you welcome the repenting sinner and you freely forgive your people. Thank you that all of our sins have already been dealt with in Christ and we bless you that we are accepted in him. Nonetheless, we have interrupted our fellowship with our dear Father in heaven on account of our wickedness and our turning away. And we pray.
pray, Lord, that you may restore us so that we may enjoy perfect love and communion with you. We ask that we may be finally saved from all of our sins. We thank you that you have pointed out the way of salvation for us to walk in. Help us to keep your rules and to obey your commandments as our dear Saviour instructed us when he was on the earth. And we thank you that now we may look to, to you. We bless you that you have shown us many things from your word and opened our blind eyes, made alive our dead souls. And thank you that we have from you something of a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Mm. And we bless you that you have uh, commenced a, a saving and completely a revolutionary work in us that has made a new creation in Christ. And so we pray that we may dwell together as the renewed people of God in love for one another and watching over each other with great care and jealousy. So Lord, grant that we may be a faithful band of those who are bought in Christ's blood, the living in this world. And may our fellowship be with the Father and also with one another. And grant that we may speak the truth to each other in love, that we may take special care of the little ones and we bring them to you asking that you may save each one of our young ones. Please also Lord, grant that those who have strayed from your paths may be brought back. Please give to us this joy of seeing the sinner repent and give us the same heart and mind as the Father who welcomes back the prodigal. Oh Lord, may that day come to your glory. Thank you that you delight in saving sinners and pray that we too may have a burden for those who are lost and dying in their sins. Bring afresh to our mind the many millions who even as we sit here today are suffering in the fires of an eternal hell. We ask Lord that we may all more take our lives very seriously. Thank you that you have warned us many times, and even though we have not always heeded, and certainly have not heeded properly, we pray that your warnings and, and the terrors of damnation may, uh, may always be a, a signal and warning to us. Help us to do everything to finish the race that you've given us to run, the race which ends with great and wonderful, glorious and heavenly prize. And may it be that your people obtain the same Christ. We thank you for the faithful preachers of your word around our country and ask that their souls may be strengthened today in honouring you in the preaching of your word. Remove from all your faithful preachers the fear of men and grant that they may so be aware of the eye of the Almighty God upon them the hand of your power within them, that they preach only your word with great boldness and courage and in the truth of the scriptures. So Lord, grant that your churches may be built up and that your congregations may be established and strengthened so that uh, together they are of one heart and mind in Christ, uh, dwelling together in great unity. We also thank you for those, our brothers, far and wide, who labor in your vineyard in one place or another. We thank you for those that preach evangelistically often and ask that you would give us, too, the burden for those that are lost and an ability to speak to those who are near us and yet dying in their sins. We also pray for those involved in the training of pastors, both at, especially those at Greenville Seminary and also our own men and students at John Wilkins College. For the Lord, watch over these men and grant that they may be useful to you in the ministry in days to come. Grant that they may be godly, holy men who believe the 
truth of the scriptures without compromise. We thank you again for the privilege of operating Good Neighbors Bookshop and Augustine Book Room. And we pray for the grace of God to be spread far and wide through the means of good books. May your church be strengthened in the land, your church which is so weak and so much in need of, of being strong in the, the ways of Christ. So help us and help all who labor in these regards. They may uh, look forward to a reward from you and may do well in these days. Help us now all, Lord, to be quiet before you. We thank you for your word that dwells amongst your people. Help us to receive it with soft and gracious hearts and give us teachable spirits and help us not to be proud and hard-hearted and so to put off and not profit from the word. Thank you again for your gift of your servants to us. We pray that your servants may be strengthened in this work and calling. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Tim number 139. In 139, joy in all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power. In 139.
Apologies for keeping you waiting. Would you please now turn to 2 Peter, chapter 1. can buy you a lot of other things. But that's not what life 
is about. Life is about the world to come. And it's interesting to notice that, uh, that Peter talks about laying aside this tent. I think it is right to refresh your memory, verse uh, 13. As long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Uh, again, both Peter and Paul uh, are really glad to use this phrase. Uh, their bodies a tent. Well, why is that? Well, you remember that uh, Abraham lived in a tent, didn't he? Never had a house. Well, he had a house in, uh, when he left uh, the place where he was born. Uh, but uh, when he went to the promised land of Canaan, he never had a house. And why was it? Well, as I remind you, and have done again and again and again, but you forget, <laughs> right? That here we have no continuing city. Here we are pilgrims and strangers. And so we live in these tents that, well, uh, mine's getting a bit, uh, a bit tatty <laughs> and uh, frayed at the edges. Uh, and so on. Uh, but I have this wonderful assurance. It's not going to be long before I lay this tent aside. Uh, worn out, uh, tatty, uh, full of holes, uh, and so on. And glad to lay it aside. And uh, the Apostle. Uh, refers to that uh, to remind us of these important truths. How much time we waste on total rubbish. Rubbish. Rubbish that we uh, enjoy for five minutes and then it's gone and it's forgotten. And then we need some more rubbish. Isn't that right? You see, I could embarrass most of you, I'm sure, by asking you to put up your hand if you've kept up with the daily readings. I don't expect that as many as, as half of you have done so. Why not? Uh, because uh, the world's very really attractive to us. <laughs> And we've forgotten, you see, that this is just a passing phase. It's our life is like a mist that lies on the ground in the early morning and then disappears when the sun rises. And so we need to be reminded again and again and again. And our Saviour was aware of this. And so he made provision. What was that provision? Hmm? What's Can you tell me one? What's your question? I can't hear you. Your question, what was it? Oh, you me a question. <laughs> <laughs> Our Saviour took, made plans to make sure that we don't forget. But he was aware of our nature. He was aware that we need to be constantly reminded of the gospel. So what did he do? The Lord's Supper. Yes, he instituted the Lord's Supper as a perpetual reminder until the end of the age. And if we didn't have the Lord's Supper, you see, twice a month, we wouldn't think very often that Jesus came into the world for the specific reason of dying for our sins so that we might be forgiven and have intimate fellowship with God and have our attention directed to glory, to heaven. Oh, the 
celebration of the Lord's Supper twice a month is so important from time to time I wonder whether we shouldn't have it every week. The, the elders have a, a mind to introduce it. Uh, at, uh, you know, every week, alternatively, evening and morning. Uh, I wouldn't oppose that. Now, the Reformed churches uh, overreacted against the, the Roman Catholic practice of uh, ad infinitum celebrating the Mass. Which then becomes meaningless. And so you find that some Reformed churches only celebrate the Lord's Supper once every three months. Oh, it's not enough. It's not enough. Because this is our nature, we forget the vital, important issues of life too soon. Indeed, many of you are no sooner out of the door of the church when you have forgotten what the sermon was about. This is our nature. And we need to be alert, we need to be wary of the weakness and the frailty and the uh, uh, lack of, uh, of living constantly in the context of eternity. Every day we forget, right? Yeah. And we all want you. And so Peter emphasizes three times, verse 12, I will always remind you it is right to refresh your memory. Uh, verse 3. And will make every effort to see after my departure that you will always be able to remember these things. Verse 15. Now, it may well be that uh, that's what prompted him uh, to write Mark's Gospel. And it's uh, pretty generally accepted that uh, Mark's Gospel was actually Peter telling Mark, and Mark uh, wrote it down. Uh, theologians are aware that Peter's Greek wasn't very good. If he came to John Wycliffe College, uh, I think he'd battle with the Greek. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, there's a different standard of Greek. This is just by the way. And uh, it's prompted some people to say, you see, some theologians uh, to question whether 2 Peter really is Peter's letter. But the answer to that is very simple. Peter, we know, had Mark to help him write. And then it would appear that he had somebody else, perhaps Silas, to help him write uh, the second letter. Or the other way around, I, I can't quite recall. But Mark's Gospel, I think, may well have been written uh, in answer, as a result of people, of uh, Peter saying, uh, I, So I will always remind you uh, of these things. And he says, Because I know that I will soon put aside this tent. And I will make, verse 15, every effort to see that after my departure, well, that doesn't mean that he's going to come back as a spook and uh, wake them up in the morning and just to remind them. No, no, it clearly refers then to his making plans, and it would seem that that was to produce Mark's gospel, which way, and uh, probably was the first gospel to be written. The importance then of a constant reminder. And you and I need to remind each other. Uh, 
very really do we speak to each other of the death of our Saviour? Why not? Why is that so? You'll find, you see, when Christians get together, uh, perhaps for some function or other, you know, somebody's birthday party or uh, some, uh, uh, some do, you get together and you have lunch together and, uh, and you'll find that one or two or three guys will get together and what do they talk about? They talk about the rugby. That's the thing in the world. But I can't recall two or three guys getting together at some little function and they're talking about Christ and his death. Now, what's more important to us? A stupid game? or our eternal welfare? Well, of course, you all know the answer. Then why don't we practice what we know to be true? And so may I encourage you, often, you know, when we used to have church lunches, I would try, I would sit somewhere and, and just try, you know, to get the conversation on spiritual things. And so I ask a question, and there's one short answer, and we're back to talking about the stupid rugby. Now, I'm a rugby fan, no Christian, but I enjoy talking about rugby. And I would have been very glad to have been able to play on pieces of rugby. Let me just tell you that uh, I was barred from playing all sport because. Uh, well, for certain reasons. And um, well, the reasons are simply that if I fell on the ground, uh, my skin, where I was burnt many years ago, would just slide off, you see. That's how I was barred uh, from all sports at school. I so after school, and, and as a young man of uh, 18, 19, I had an opportunity to play in a few games, which I've never forgotten. And I played centre or wing. And every game I played in, I scored a try. Never forgotten. Uh, but it's just a game. Will rugby be played in glory? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But I would be surprised if we didn't play some game or some sport. So may I urge you when the service is over and you're standing outside or inside talking, would you all try and make a point and talk about Jesus? And how important his death is to you. It is the most vital fact of history. Now, uh, on this point, I remember in John 20, verse 29, uh, Jesus was reassuring and dealing graciously with Thomas who said he wouldn't believe uh, that Christ was alive unless he could put his finger into the, the uh, holes in his hands and his hand in his side and so on and Jesus then appears and says come put your finger in my hands and believe and then he went on to say you see blessed are those. Uh, he said, because you see, you believe. Listen to those.
was not seen, and yet have believed. So he's aware, you see, of the difficulty that we have of living in this world. And every day having to live with what the world is offering us, is grabbing our attention constantly, right? Constantly. Yeah, you turn on the television and there the world is reaching out and grabbing you. Uh, you're driving your motor car down the road and there the world is reaching out to grab you. Constantly. Mm -hmm. You open your newspaper and there the world is reaching out to grab you. Oh. I need to underline this again and again and again. Brothers, sisters, talk about Christ. Talk about his victory on the cross. Study it. Ask questions. Delve into it. And share what the Lord brings to you. The second point in our, and there's no particular text this uh, morning, I uh, thought I would just uh, uh, try and conclude uh, chapter 2. Um, Peter's then come concerned uh, to assure us that what we believe as Christians is gospel truth. He says we have not followed Verse 16, cleverly invented stories and we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his glory. And he's concerned to make two points here to reassure us that uh, this Bible is totally and utterly and completely trustworthy. He refers to his own testimony, how he and James and John have actually seen the majesty of Christ on the mountain. But they said nothing until after his resurrection on the instructions of the Saviour. There was good reason for that which we won't go into. But then he also refers to the prophecies. And may I say again, I've seen to so several times before. The Hebrew prophecies are unique. There have been other prophets in this world. Most of them completely false, scary bags. And, uh, and Peter, you see, uh, will refer to that in chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And we've uh, noted that, and uh, we remember that uh, Jesus warned about that, that uh, when the farmer sows good seed, the enemy comes at night and sows weeds where the good seed has been. So that's the enemy's strategy. And so we need to be awake. We need to be alert. And we need to remember a further thing that Jesus again and again warned his disciples to watch and to pray. But we forget and we become casual. And uh, when things have gone smoothly, you see, for a year or two, we then become careless in watching and praying. And as again, I've said many times before, the devil never slumbers nor sleeps. 
and always is looking for an opportunity. Oh dear brothers and sisters, I don't know whether I'll ever preach to you again. Please take urgent note. You must watch and pray. You must live in the context of eternity. You must be constantly thinking and constantly grateful for Christ's amazing, magnificent, glorious death on the cross so that all our sins might be forgiven. And I'm afraid, you see, the people do invent clever stories. And uh, the church has never been free of them. And uh, you'll find a number of churches in Randburg uh, full of people who will tell you, oh, the Lord said to me, da 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 when you start asking a few questions, uh, well, then you find, in fact, this whole thing is questionable. Uh, people want to get attention. And they want to be well thought of. Cleverly, cleverly invented stories. Now, uh, I should uh, urge you to investigate uh, what you believe and, uh, and be sure that you know that it is true. For example, the Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, that cover basically the same stuff, not entirely, uh, but 80 to 90 percent of it is basically the same stuff. But there are differences. And Bible critics, you see, have grabbed hold of that. And they said, well, there you are, you see. Mark doesn't agree with Luke. And Luke doesn't agree with Matthew. But that's nonsense. When I, many years ago, used to settle claims for the SA Eagle and uh, insurance company, motor claims. It was important, you see, to get hold of many witnesses as possible. And you know what? No two witnesses agreed. Well, why is that? Well, because they were at different vantage points. And what they saw was from their perspective. And far from indicating that because they don't agree that this now you know, that means that uh, this is just a book written by religious men. The truth is that because they don't agree, what they write is the truth. Do you think Luke is so stupid? This, uh, this doctor, uh, who tells us that he, he carefully checked with eyewitnesses all the stories. Now, we know that he wrote after Matthew and he wrote after Mark. He was aware of what they had written. Do you think now that he's going to write something that contradicts what they write? No. It's from a different angle. And these are all, you see, incidental proofs that this word is not cleverly invented stories. But it is 
God's revelation of all that you and I need to know about Him because to know Him is eternal life. And all that we need to know about ourselves. And Peter then says further, the word of the prophets is made more certain and it's like a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in their hearts. Okay, let me ask you, what, do you, what on earth do you think Peter's talking about? Let's start with the morning star. What's he referring to when he, he says, until the morning star rises in your hearts. What's the morning star? Yes? Yes, it's the Lord Jesus, right? It's one of the titles that he has in the Old Testament. The bright and morning star. Now, what is the morning star? Tell us. Right, sometimes early in the morning you can get up and you see the only star in the sky is the morning star. What's it telling us? Dawn is about to break. And so, when Peter says, verse 19, we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Well, clearly, you see, the Old Testament prophets wrote amazing prophecies. But many of them were not being have been understood. Certainly, you see, what Isaiah writes, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastised, <laughs> given a damn hiding. We better tell to you. What was that all about? It was for that we might be forgiven. And uh, virtually nobody, you see, when Jesus came into the world, understood that that referred to him. But no, he was a, a prophet, not the Son of God. And, and we've had a couple of sermons on this, right? That God should come into the world as a man and go to the cross, bearing our sins and paying the price in full was a mystery. And I remind you again how the disciples, when Jesus spoke plainly about his coming death, they wouldn't accept it. Don't talk rubbish! was Peter's reaction. Why? Because they were looking at one aspect of the Messiah, right? He would come and introduce the great Davidic Empire, and the Jews would rule the world. So, the word of the prophets are made more certain more clear with the coming of Jesus into the world and he's going to the cross. Now, you see, the disciples understood Isaiah. And not only the disciples, but now the angels understood Isaiah. They didn't know. 
this is the mystery to be revealed. And so, the Gospel, the New Testament, um, Gospel content then, helps us to understand what the prophets were saying so much more clearly. And as a result, the darkness into which you and I were born slowly, slowly recedes as the light pushes it back. Now, of course, those who are not real believers, they don't like the light, right? No, they withdraw from the light. Why? Because Jesus says they don't like the light because their deeds are evil. And the light will expose their deeds. But those to whom God is gracious and whose eyes are opened as the light continues to come in and is more and more and more understanding What's the result? We're drawn closer and closer to the morning star. And our attention is directed more and more to the dawn of this glorious new day of eternity. Now I want to just conclude by reminding you of something else. What was that? Well, the last time I preached, I uh, was giving some attention to a rich welcome. Do you remember what that was about? What was this rich welcome? Well, it was to tell us, you see, that. Uh, we're not going to feel out of place in heaven. We'll have new bodies, but there'll be real bodies that eat real food and drink real wine. Now, not all of you drink wine. But I venture to say, in the new heaven, you are going to love the wine.
So read the scripture with your eyes open and see what's being said and ask questions. One of the weaknesses of our daily readings that uh, John has put together is unfortunately that uh, there's so much to read uh, that it's going to hinder your meditating and pondering and questioning just what is there for us. One of the Puritans, I can't remember who many years ago I read it somewhere, and he was uh, talking about this, and he was saying, he used these words, I can't remember my shot. He said, Oh, suck the marrow out of the bones. You see, some of the best is in the marrow and the bones. And for the most part, it's thrown away. It's rich. And it's, uh, it's good for you. A rich... You're never going to get bored in glory. And as I said before, you see, deal with this false idea that there we're all going to be, millions of us all standing around uh, with our psalm books and forever and ever and ever singing praises to God at infinitum. It's not going to happen. You'd get bored. Right? Be honest. You see, people don't say, uh, you know, they don't think. And they think, oh no, we never get bored praising and worshipping and honouring God. But singing praises is not the only way we worship Him. I think it was Wesley's mother. I'm open to correction. You see, this is part of the problem with the, the tent getting tatty and, and falling into holes. That uh, whoever it was, I'm sure Jim will know, uh, he knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it makes him proud. Folks, seriously, I didn't intend to say anything about this. God has brought this ill health upon him to deal with his pride. And the result is, he doesn't listen to advice. Yes, I see half a dozen hands nodding. Jim, please, please, what do you want the Lord to do? Do you want him to take one of your legs off? I mean, you know, the ball's in your court. You're not right all of the time. You may be right nine times out of ten, but that's incredible. Listen to those who come to help you. Even your wife is told. Jim doesn't listen to anybody. He thinks he knows everything. He thinks he knows best. I see Trish looking at her husband. You've got the same problem, have you? <laughs> I'm afraid that generally this is a bad problem. Okay? We think we know. And as well as my brother said, he gave himself away, you see, a few days ago. Uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, something, and I asked about his wife, and he said, uh, oh, my extension. His wife is his extension. That's how he thinks of it. <laughs> but you know, most of us guys have the same attitude. 
My wife's my extension of me. It's not biblical, man. Eh? It's not sound theology. It's just honoring to God. And it's honoring to your wife. But now, I want to go to Australia. Yes, we're talking about this rich rock. I just wanted to remind you of it. And I was talking about this, this lady, this, this mother, who had, I think, about 10 or 12 children. And, uh, and there were two things I remember about her. It was very difficult for her to get alone to have her quiet time. Because there's so many children making so many demands upon her, and so she gets up on this plan. She puts her apron over her head. And the children then knew, shh, mom's with Jesus. But the other thing I wanted to get across, you see, what is honoring and worship God, worshiping God? Well, this mother had a sign above the kitchen sink. And the sign said, Divine service performed here three times a day. <laughs> yeah. Right? Ladies, the housework you do, or whatever you do, must be the worship of God. And when we get to glory, you see, we will find that's the case. Whatever God has for us to do. <coughs> and if he makes you the king over ten cities, you will be absolutely perfect ruler in the worship of God. A rich brother will never get bored in heaven. I think some of the hymn writers have misled us a little bit. your signs up to remind you to do something. You see, my wife has a, has a shopping list up on the wall, you see, when she thinks, oh, I need to get this, otherwise when she goes off, she forgets to get off the stuff. So she writes on her list, and when she goes shopping, she takes a list down. Well, put a little sign up there to remind you. Think about the rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Saviour Christ that's waiting for me. And then think about it. So I will always remind you of these things. And so I urge you all to remind each Let us pray. Precious Saviour, as you well know, we are of the earth earthy. Uh, we are by nature uh, comfortable in this world. And there's every reason not to be. Uh, for it's all founded on lies and deception and subterfuge. And it will destroy us. Mm. Gracious Lord, remind us every day what an amazing fact it is that you who created
created the whole universe with a word. You who created the myriads of angels and archangels and uh, seraphim and, uh, and everything that exists that you should so love in your people that you became a man so that as a man you would qualify to go to the horrors of the cross and then pay for all our sins. Oh, God, that we may think and ponder on this amazing, life-changing truth every day that we have to do in this world. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit truly be amongst us and with us as his dear children. Amen. Amen.